Well, I think we should get started for tonight. Um, <clears throat> I was going to take on testing for this evening. Um, so what we'll do is we'll spend some time discussing chapter 21. Uh, I am going to just straight up as a disclaimer, say that uh, this at this point in the book, it's really pushing my knowledge set and what I know. And so this is more, well, it's for the group, but more for somebody who's watching this later. The stuff that I present tonight, uh, this is like a week worth of experience. It's not years of development experience. So uh, if anybody's watching this later and is like, this guy has no idea what he's talking about, it's because some parts I don't know what I'm talking about. So um, if you are somebody watching this later and you're like uh, somebody who has a lot of experience in this, this may not be the conversation for you. It might be, but I just want to give everybody a disclaimer that there may be some parts that I struggle through. So do not be afraid to stop me and correct me in any way, uh, because this is like, I was talking with Connor a little bit earlier today. This is like a point where in the book, I just don't have a lot of experience with. And I literally started, started testing a week ago. So this is the best I got. Um, but we'll talk about testing tonight. Uh, I did put together a I put together an example application um, for us to kind of use tonight because I followed Kevin's direction from last time. He mentioned that the previous cohort had a really good kind of example. And I, I'm, it's not as good as Russ's, but it still was something that allowed me to kind of learn and, and get my like mind around. So I put together a public GitHub repository um, with the application and the code. Again, be nice. Uh, like I'm still learning. So if it's not up to, if it's not up to production standard, please be nice with it, but it works and it has a testing framework. So, and it kind of exhibits some of the examples that were covered in the book. So what we're going to do is we'll talk about the chapter 21. Let me start sharing my screen. I will be jumping back and forth between my R session and the book and the notes. And so I'll be jumping around a little bit. I'll try my best to um, keep everybody up to date what I'm looking at and, and try not to confuse anybody. If I do, you know, just please stop me. But let me share my screen here. I'm going to go number two. Can people see my screen? Okay, great. Uh, so like, like tonight, like I said, we're going to talk about chapter 21. Uh, I'm going to kind of rely on some of the previous cohorts notes. So there's going to be some stuff in here that I'm not going to cover, but I've kind of used this because I spent a lot more time just kind of getting my hands dirty of like creating an application, creating a module and creating a testing framework around it. And that took a considerable amount of time, but it gives me a good example to kind of share with you of my thinking of what testing looks like and how to deploy it. So the learning outcomes for tonight is really to kind of talk about big picture, what's the purpose of testing, and then we'll talk about the different types of tests. We'll talk about the different balance that you have with the different types of tests that are available, and then really talk about um, testing in the framework of Shiny, especially with Shiny having the special, special case of, of uh, running code in a reactive context. And so tests that you might perform in a package maybe you have to do a couple more things in a shiny application because of that reactive context. In addition to that, there's, um, there's other tests that, that can be used to test JavaScript. There's uh, tests that can be run to do for graphics. And then there was an outside material that Kevin shared with me earlier this week to kind of help out that talks about load testing. And so some of those things I'm, I'm not too familiar with, but we'll discuss those a little bit. But really the big purpose of testing is it's, it basically is to allow us to create more complex apps. And so we are all human here and we are all fallible. And part of that is, is that we have a limited capacity to hold things in our minds. Um, and so there gets to be a point that once your app is really complex, there's a lot of dependencies within the application it gets a lot harder to track those dependencies and keep those in, organized in our mind. And so if we can offload some of that onto our testing framework, then that allows us, um, that allows us the ability to create more complex apps because we're not worried about thinking about like, if I do this one change, how is it gonna affect things later on or 
down the stream in the application. The other thing, it creates a safety net. So um, what it really kind of does is it gives you kind of that safety net. What I mentioned before is if you make a minor change somewhere, it shows you what uh, it shows you how that or could potentially show how it affects your application later on. So if you make a breaking change within your application, rather than rerunning the application, testing it a bunch of times, you know, uh, spending time kind of doing, uh, you know, kind of messing around with the application, it will immediately give you feedback of like, hey, something's broken or it's not working as you expected it to work. And so that's kind of the other reason too. And then something that I forgot to add, um, can anybody, can everybody hear me? Okay, because it said my AirPods yep. were switching over and I don't think I have my AirPods. You're good. Okay, cool. Your default speaker has changed. Well, my AirPods are in my pocket, so. All right, well, whatever, as long as everybody can hear me. Um, and then the other thing that I kind of, um, I should have added to this, but something that was interesting while I was kind of creating this tep, uh, this kind of playing around with testing with this application that I generated was this idea of it, it, it changes your thinking a little bit. And so it's really nice or, and I'm, and, and again, like, I don't have a lot of experience with this, but it kind of changed my mindset. Like once I set up a test for like a function or something that's going on in my application, it really changed my thought process of like, okay, am I breaking the application or am I breaking the test? And so it was kind of nice to kind of think about like, okay, having that extra kind of in my back of my mind of if I make this change, is it going to fail this test? And so it really kind of forced me and created some like guardrails for me to be like, okay, if I make this change, what effects is it going to have downstream? And if, if I do make this change, is it going to, is it going to kick off like a failed test? And so it was kind of nice. It, it was like a change in like my mindset of like creating the application. And I could see how thinking about your tests and how your tests are influenced by your application code really affect like creating quality um, quality applications. So I, 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 that was something I took away from it. Go ahead. Yeah. I find it a bit addicting. I love it. Once you get uh, testing, you think of all, it can be kind of a, you got to be careful <laughs> not to get carried away. Uh, because it, it's very addicting. I'll spend Saturdays just like an hour, hour and a half, just trying to think of ways that my code can break and writing a test for it. It's kind of fun, you know, strange sort of way. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Like, I think it's it, like, it, it was just, it was just a different way of thinking. Like I've never, like I never in my, all my experience that I've done, you know, developing R you know, working in R, I've never kind of had that thinking of like, you know, the, the testing framework. And like you said, Kevin, it is kind of addicting because you're like, what can I test for? Oh, is this the right test? You know, and stuff like that. And so it is, you kind of get bitten by the bug a little bit. And so that, that's kind of interesting to think about. There's different types of tests. There's unit tests, there's testing reactivity. Uh, there's testing reactivity in a module. There's testing JavaScript, testing visuals, load tests. And I'm sure there's probably many other different tests that are out there, um, but they won't be discussed tonight or they won't be discussed in this book. The ones we'll mostly focus on tonight are unit tests, testing reactivity, testing re reactivity in a module. I'll talk about this, but I had a little bit of trouble of getting this to work. So maybe Ryan, you could provide some input on this one because this one was a little bit beyond um, you know, what I know, especially with like the JavaScript backend and all that stuff. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, so then we got the balance. We have the discussion of like the speed of our tests, the fragility of our tests and code coverage. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to reiterate, you know, that again, we're working in a reactive context when we're creating our tests within shiny. And so there's some things that we have to do, um, to, uh, have tests within that reactive context. So um, we've kind of already talked talk, talked about this a little bit, but purpose of testing really ensures that any new features that we add to our application don't break our existing code. It also ensures that bugs only arise once. So the book talks about, especially when it gets to the philosophy part of creating tests, is that if you find a bug within your code, it's a good thing to 
write a test for that bug or to check for that bug in the future so that you don't run into it again and you know when it happens when you make changes. It also helps you write new code. So, um, you know, with my experience of thinking about it was, is, is that as you're developing it, it kind of creates those guardrails for you of like, if I make this change or I do this one thing, what, what tests are going to fail for me? And if they're going to fail, then how can I write my application or my code in a way so that I can keep those tests still passing? It also gives you confidence. Um, you know, I haven't really developed a lot of packages before, but obviously there's dependencies when you create a package. So um, R is a software, it's a software language. It gets periodic updates. And so when that updates creates breaking changes. And so you could have tests that test for any breaking changes that happen with that update. Um, same thing with packages, packages change all the time. And so if there's an updated package, you could create a test to test if there's any breaking changes from that update in the package. And then if there's any change in data, right? So if you have data, um, you know, if you have to validate your data in some way, or you have some data manipulation within your application, or your data changes, it's good to have a test to say, like, if this changes, what effects is it going to have? And then when I was watching the other uh, cohorts um, discussion about this, uh, Russ mentioned that it's also great to keep your colleagues happy and to give you the ability to go on holiday. Because if you have tests and somebody's working on your code when you go on vacation and they have failing tests, and if they're doing something with your application when you're away or they're going to you know, push it into production or something and they have failing tests, they know that they shouldn't push it to that kind of production environment. And so they kind of have, again, those guardrails and it makes you feel better so that you don't have to do any like changing of your application while you're on vacation. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so there's some more discussions that they talk about, uh, you know, I wasn't really clear on what the previous cohort was talking about with don't test the framework. Um, so if anybody has any input on that, and then they also mentioned don't test too early or do. And so, um, you know, like, like Kevin said, it's one of those things where it does get kind of addicting, but there's a certain point of like, how much value is this extra test going to add? And so if it's not going to add anything to it, yeah, it might be great that it's a test that always passes, or it does something that's, you know, very minor or test for something that's not, um, you know, doesn't have, isn't very critical. You got to question if you want to spend your time focusing on that or actually developing features. So you kind of have that balance. Uh, there's also some different ways of thoughts or different approaches to the way people go about testing. Uh, I will be honest, I don't have enough experience to talk about all three of these, but the previous cohort mentioned that these are the three that are out there. There's test-driven development, there's behavior-driven development, and then there's the test and commit and revert um, kind of frameworks. I don't have a lot of experience. Does anybody here have experience with using any of these approaches? No. <laughs> uh, again, I think Russ does a pretty good job. And like I said, if anybody's watching this later, definitely go watch it because Russ does a pretty good job of like explaining like what these three are. Um, the one, the one that I really kind of understood was test driven development. This idea that you develop your test before you develop your code. And so what you're trying to do is, is that you first develop your tests. So setting up your expectations of what your functions or whatever your application is going to do and then you develop your, your code to pass that test. That's the one that I really understood, um, but the behavior driven and then the, the test commit and revert, it kind of went over my head. So um, if anybody has any input, you know, just please let me know. And then there was this other thing that as I kind of went down that road of looking at testing, um, kind of going down like the software engineering route of like testing as a whole, not just testing it in a shiny context or testing within R, is this idea that you develop tests for, for quality. But one thing that kept coming up, and I thought this was kind of an interesting insight for me, and we can discuss it further, was this idea of, you know, you're testing for quality, but quality is subjective. It's, it's based on context. 
because when I first approached this testing idea or the idea of testing your code, it was like, well, somebody had to develop all the tests that you would ever need for your code. So what are the common tests that people do? And you can spend time, like I've done, going down that rabbit hole of like, what test should I be running? What should I be doing? But there's a lot, there's some perspectives that I came across in my research for tonight where it was this idea of that your tests are context specific. It's specific to your application. It's specific to your code. It's specific to how you define quality. And when you look at like software engineering as a whole, and again, I do not consider myself a software engineer and I'm far from that, but the perspectives that I came across, it was like that quality is determined by your customer. It's determined by your team. And so that's what your testing framework should be because you may find in one context, certain tests are important compared to others in a different context. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting perspective, especially with my first mindset of like, well, what are the common tests I should be running? You know, why can't I just create a test file and just throw them in there and then it automatically tests it? Well, it's context specific. It's specific to your application. It's, spe it's specific to what you want to test for. So before we kind of jump into um, the examples for tonight, um, does anybody have any questions that they have right now or any comments or uh, just anything in general before we kind of start talking about the specific examples. Just real quick, I was going to say my approach is to start really simple and what would be the most embarrassing if something slipped past me. <laughs> That's my testing framework. <laughs> make sure there's no null values in here. Um, make sure the number of column, my favorite, my first test is always the number of columns I expect <laughs> back <laughs> just to get started, just to prime the pump. <laughs> and then get more complex after that. And I think that's a good point, Kevin. I mean, I think it's the way I've kind of thought of it is it's like, it's an iterative process. Like it's iterative and it's gonna, you know, cause you're gonna come across the bug, you come across the bug, that's a great time to write a test. Or, you know, as you keep developing your application, it gets more complex. There might be some things that you wanna offload because there's things that you just like continually do over and over and over again to see if your application's working and you're like, man, it would be great if I could just go, you know, shift command T and just run tests. And I could just feel confident that all that stuff is run without yeah. having to develop and then keep going back. Sorry, Kevin, go ahead. Just, no, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just haven't opinionated on it since I've started doing tests is that uh, I always have to check for duplicate entries. And I would, I had a flashback of a couple of years ago when I'd run my app and push it out to shiny apps io i'd have a notebook in my phone and i'd count <laughs> to make sure the numbers added up across like the counts and now i before i push it up i just run a test and it tells me if there's an issue and then i can i just push <laughs> and so i literally just take like a a notebook in my calculator my phone calculator and count make sure the numbers added up <laughs> before i told everyone it's good to go so <laughs> And it just saves so much time. Like when I was doing it, I was like, this probably could save so much time. Um, I, and then there's another conversation that it came, and I think it was actually in the book that it talks about, you know, yes, it, it creates like that, that sense of confidence, but don't get too much confidence because you could be writing tests that are just false positives. And so, you know, um, that was kind of an interesting perspective too of like, yeah, testing's great. It kind of gives you that confidence of it, but you also got to be a little bit careful because there might be situations where you're just writing a test that's always going to pass. It's never going to catch what you think it's going to catch. And so um, it's just, it's just, I thought it was kind of interesting. It's just a different way of thinking. But so anyways, um, so the four levels of testing for Shiny Apps uh, are uh, doing tests for non-reactive functions. So these are like your unit tests. So if you've written packages before, you more likely, um, you probably are familiar with those fun or unit tests. I'll show an example of that tonight. Um, then there's the input value driven updates to reactives and outputs. And so looking at your inputs, validating your inputs and checking to make sure that if you make any changes within your application, if those inputs or if those reactive inputs and outputs change, or if they're broken from some change, um, you'll catch it in your test. There's also browser driven tests. Um, I had a little trouble about getting this started for tonight. So I don't know if I'll have a great example of it, but we'll talk about it. But um, anything that has to do with like JavaScript, you have to do a browser driven test. 
And so you have to run, they, they mentioned a headless browser. So just running it in the background without actually having a browser open. And then there's visual output of the application. So there's ways that you can check the screenshots of your application. And I thought that was kind of cool, um, but I didn't really get a good example of that one either, but it discusses that. And <clears throat> so there's different ones that we could do, um, you know, looking at reactive from stateless behavior, looking at UI dependent and independent, independent uh, behavior and values from visuals and stuff like that. And so we'll kind of share some examples of, of what we're going to discuss. So tonight, what I put together, um, you can access your uh, cohort one's first example. And again, if you watch the first cohort one, I think Russ does an excellent job. Mine is not anywhere near the level of that, but he discusses it using the ER injuries app for chapter four. But with this example, and I'll kind of share it with you here. Let me get it started here. So basically, I spent some time over the week kind of developing this basic application. Uh, what it does is it takes data from, uh, it's data from Google's uh, merchandise store. So this is e-commerce data. So basically, it's just um, web analytics data. And it's freely available. Google provides it for people to use to kind of mess around and play with. So I decided to create an application around it. And basically what this application does is it just trends out two metrics. It just trends out users, it trends out purchases, and it provides a table for people to see like the specific users page view session starts for a specific date. Um, it gives you an input to select the date range. So if you want to change it to like December and look at just December, um, there's a reactive element into it and it changes the trend. And if you want to check, you know, a different trend line, you can look at mean, linear, um, and I think it's low S. You can look at different trends for it. And so that's basically what the application is. It's really simple. Just two inputs, date range, and um, uh, selecting the trend for that, that you want. So what we're going to first look at is just kind of like a, oh, and here's the GitHub repository. I, I passed out the link for you. If you want to use this, use this application, dig into it later and to look at how I kind of set it up, you're more than welcome to it. I'm probably going to keep developing it, so it might change, but it still kind of gives you that general framework. So the first thing that we have to know if we're going to create a testing framework around our application is, is that we have to put it into a package. And so it has to have a package structure. Um, Russ talks about getting uh, the package that, that holds your application to pass the R command check. Um, I'm not that good yet. I don't know all the tests that are run by the R command check, um, but this is for people who are interested on in putting like package code onto CRAN. There's a specific command or there's a specific check that R has that runs a bunch of tests so that you know if it goes on for review, those tests have to pass before you get onto CRAN. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to add a test for a non-reactive function. We're going to look at adding a test to a server, an app server function, and then adding a test within a modules server function. Okay. If you want to run the app, all you need to do is just load everything and then run GA4 app and it kicks off and you can look at it from there. So let's talk about um, the testing framework that we're going to use. Specifically in the book, it talks about using test that. Um, basically, what test that does is that when you create a test, um, you're going to use test, or you're going to use um, you're going to use test that to actually run these actual tests. And so to look at our app structure, I'm going to bring over um, my R Studio here for now. When you actually create a test, you're going to use um, you're going to use a function called use this, and it's going to be create. Oh uh, no, it's going to be use this. Excuse me. Use this. Use test. Use test. So you use this function called use test, and what it does is the first time that you use this this function right here, it's going to set up your testing framework. 
And basically one step in that framework that it creates is it creates this test file within your package. Nested within that test file is this test that.r file, which I'm assuming just runs your test check. So every time that you run your tests, it's just running those specific files. But all of your tests get put in this test that file and each, each function file that you have and that you've created a test for creates the uh, specific test. So, and they get appended with a test dash, whatever the, the um, functions file name is. And so you can see right here, I have four different files that contain different tests within it to test my specific code. So to actually run these tests, um, I've just found it really easy to learn the, the hotkey. So just shift command T. Um, this what, what it will do, and this is all happening within your build console. So, and maybe I should open this up so you can see this, so you know where it's at. Um, on my R setup, I have my console and my environment tabs over here. And basically what this is, is that this, you're gonna be looking in the build tab, but what you do is, is that you go shift command T, it runs all of your tests and it gives you outputs for your specific tests. And basically here's your output for your tests. It tells you, um, how, did it fail? Is there a warning? Was it skipped or was it okay? And in my case, at this current state of the application, um, all six of my tests pass. And so you'll also notice too that within this, each file um, can have more than one test. So this mod trend viz table actually has three tests that I've included into it. And so it runs those three tests. Now, if any of these tests fail, what it will do is, is it will show fail, but then it will give you a trace back of what failed for you to help identify where the test failed and you know what's wrong with it. A uh, couple times when I was playing around with it, um, it gave me informative output. Other times I was like, I have no idea what's failing. So it's just going back to that debugging process that we talked about before of like, if something goes wrong, you know, identify where it's going wrong. This is your first place to look because it might give you a tip of like where your tests are actually failing and why they might be failing. Okay. So what questions do people have about you know, creating a test using use this or kind of the testing workflow to run your tests. Or any comments? <laughs> so right. Each test has okay. its own script. Yeah, so that's a good point. Yeah, so basically um, what it does, so here's, and I'll show you this first one. Let's just talk about unit testing. So I created this, um, Let's talk about what the test does. So here's my application and it's dead, of course. So what I did, let me get my app up again. So in my application on this table right here, um, how the data gets returned is it's like event underscore date users page underscore view. So what I decided to do is I decided to create a, just a simple function that does some name cleaning. And so, what you do is you have this first function. Uh, it's right here, create column names, create column names. Yep, so this is, the, this is the actual function that cleans up those column names. And so because I have this one function here, I also created a test for it as well. And that test file is here, tests, test that, and it's test clean column names. And so right here, it's like its own file to which you use this structure of test that and you write your actual test code within it. So did that clear that up, Connor? So, yeah. oh, go ahead. Yes. I was gonna say that tripped me up when I first learned to uh, do testing too. And also make sure you, you know, you make your library calls in there too, because that will error out and it won't give you an informative error message. So I think that was the issue that I was having because there was a couple times where it was saying like your test was like, hey, can't find Tribble, can't find Tribble. And so then I tried to do like dplyr this and then, um, you know, I think that worked. 
But the other thing that I was thinking, and this is where it kind of, this is kind of where my inexperience comes in, is this idea that this is a package. And so you have package dependencies that you need to have too, because this is technically a function. And so, because I'm not totally familiar with that, I have a general idea of it. I know you can use, um, use this, use package, and then it should add it to your description file as an import, I think, and then you should be able to use it. But that's because it was like bleeding in with my inexperience with packages and everything. That's where I got like, I was just like, I don't have a good, clear picture of how that works. So I think you still, even if you put it as a dependency, when you do your test that, I think you still have to call, um, you have to make a, you may have to make a library call. And okay. if something's not working, try to put a li put a library call on it. And a lot of times it'll work. <laughs> and I think, I think why these work is because, you know, as the package structure, you're take, you're supposed to take your application and put it into a function so that you can just run the GA4 app. Unlike what we've learned before where you have the two or either have one file or two separate files where you have just the UI and the server, you need to have it in an application or you need to have it in a, its own function so that it can run. And I think why it works for me is because up here in my app code, I run the library. And so I think when it runs the test that, it runs that library. So I think that's why the test that actually works but that's a good point too kevin is if it if that doesn't work you might have to put it inside of your test yeah i was thinking more like when you have to write your script in front of it of your mm -hmm. test um and sometimes i'll put it like outside like right in that area too right above that i'll write a script to kind of be able to call things which okay. may not be great but it works See, but there's got to be a way, there's got to be a way. So I was, there's got to be a way to manage those though, because we are in a package context though, right? Like there, I thought that, I thought I read somewhere, like, like if you're just thinking of package, you know, if you have a function, there's something that you can do to automatically just import all the functions that you need for your package to run. I, that's what I thought, but I don't know if anybody's familiar with that or if I'm just in an app development, there is a way to ensure that all of your configuration is the same, no matter what time or what operating system the, the app is run on. I, I think there's a Golem uh, page, or I'm sorry, a Golem script or a Golem variable for that. It stores, it's, it's not a pack R, uh, that's one application that's outside of Golem, but there's a way to manage your, your environment, environmental variables so that when you run your app, it's validating, do I have these exact packages installed? If not, throw an error, and that's what test, test this is capturing. It, it, it's going to be a, either a warning or a failure. Oh, so like our, like RM, like our environment is like, I think one, like when you're doing like your package development, it will like take a snapshot of like the current project so that when you're using it, it runs. Again, that stuff like it's it gets really muddy for me because like I have inexperience with package development and the environment part of it and like bigger apps that would require a testing framework. And so um, it, it, there's a there's a depth folder though, isn't there, Kevin? I think I thought the depth folder contains the packages required to run in a in a in a package, a Golem package environment. Mm, it's, it's not your it's where you declare right? it. It's where you declare it. Okay. Like in the dev. And then you say yeah. use like just what Colin was doing. It's just a shortcut to uh, say okay. use this, use package. But I think I know what you're talking about. Like I think you're on the right track. I'm not exactly sure what it is um, on that testing though, to where well, it tests probably, that you have all the packages and things. Yeah, we probably all ran into the same issue. You go to load a particular package, and it says, "Oh, you can't run this package because your environment is not." you know, adequate or you're missing this particular dependency that requires this package to run this other package. Um, there's a tiered approach to this concept and that's what test that or, or the, uh, the service is doing is validating to make sure that your environment is, is able to run or get the output that you're looking for. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, 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 I understand what you're saying. It's I think because Gollum is a is an opinionated structure of how to like 
of where files are put, it's probably going to have some file in there that brings in library. But the reason why it works for me is because I've, I've already put the libraries in the app file. And so that's probably why it works. There's a, there's a couple of times that there was a couple of things that I did in here that like, I just kind of threw something at it and it just worked. And I was like, I have no idea why this works, but um, that's my view of it, of that. But um, like I said, if somebody's watching this later, this might not be the best way to do it. So I, I got it to work, but I'm not going to say I'm, I am not a software engineer. So this might be like faux pas and I shouldn't be doing this, but it works. So, um, okay, cool. So going back to tests, um, I think unit tests are kind of a good one to first kind of learn because it kind of really shows you like the basic structure of what it looks like. So when you run a test that the first thing that you're going to do is everything's going to be nested in this function called test that. But the first thing you do is you provide some type of string right here. So our a string value here. And so what this basically does is if your test fails, it will give you that information of what test failed. And in my case, this test specifically makes sure that my function that cleans those column names is doing its job or what I expect it to be doing. The next thing that you do is you create sample data. And so when you create your sample data, this is the data that you expect. This is what this is what you expect your function to return. And then um, part of this is, or no, excuse me. So the data is the data that you're gonna feed into your test. And then you provide it some other data to which you're gonna try and match it up with. So thinking of it like a function, what's your input, what's your output? And so what are you, what output are you expecting from a specific input? And that's what your next step is, is to create that test expectation. And your test expectation is, um, there's a lot of different expectations that are out there. This one's a little bit different, but the book talks about the two that you're mostly going to use are expect equal, or I think it was like expect error are the ones that you're going to do a lot of. And the book talks about there's many different ones that are out there. In my case, because I'm testing um, the names for the data set itself, I'm going to use expect name. It's just a shortcut for um, expect equal names, data, test names. And all it is, is just it's just it's just matching those two things together and saying, is what gets returned from the function what I expect it to be? And how that works later on when you're developing your application, say you make some change to your function in here. So say, say like, uh, instead of replacing underscores, I wanna do a dash, my test should fail. And so we can test my assumption here that it's gonna fail because I make that change. I run the test. My test did fail because my function that I created does not return what I expect. And that's because I made that change, you know, trying to make this change from underscores into dashes rather than underscores into spaces. And so the other way that I kind of like reconciled this in my mind, and because I think most people here are are, um, are familiar with, with uh, version control, like Git, GitLab and GitHub, it's kind of like a merge conflict. It's like, it's like Git's expecting something that gets returned, but then there's a conflict with it. Even if it's completely minor, even if it's a small little thing, it's going to fail that test. And so that was kind of the way I kind of thought of expect that. It's kind of like, kind of like version control. I don't know if that's a good way to think of it, but that's the way I kind of reconciled with it in my mind. Okay. Just real quick, I put in a link to uh, the point blank package. If you write, if you test a lot of your data output, this is a this is how I learned to write the test that because you can write um, it'll help it's like helpers to write tests on your data output and there's a function that will write a test that of your test and you can put that in the test directory and that's how I learned to structure a lot of uh, my test that and I still use it as a cheat if I can't get test that to do what I want to do. And there's some other options, um, especially with the expect that. I think um, there are some other options you can play with. And I find it, it was easier to work with um, to start. 
So. Yeah, there's a lot of different expectation tests. So um, the book talks, the book kind of shares a little bit about them. Um, but the ones that you kind of run across a lot of the book mentions, and again, I'm talking to them with a, a week's worth of experience is a lot of expect equal. You expect this to match this or this to equal this. And so the book really talks a lot about using expect equal quite a bit. And then there, that talks a little bit about expect error. So like if there's something, if some value gets passed into your function and it's going to error out, you would expect that error to show up in some way. And so you could test for that as well. But like Kevin said, there's a ton of different expects from expect that. So, and I do, I do appreciate point blank because I've looked into that and that thing is really cool for validating data. I need to incorporate more of that. I just haven't. So what other questions do people have or other comments? So now that I've made this change back to my original state, if I run my tests, everything should pass. And everything does pass because I went back to it. I changed that dash back to a, a, a space. Um, so let's clean column names. Let's see, where else we now? Okay, so we're back here. So um, let's see what's going to be next. So we talked about how to create it, what the recommended workflow is. Um, a lot of these tools to test it are going to come from the package dev tools. So um, I've just found it really easy. Um, well, I mean, there's different ways to test it, right? You can test it with the R command check. So you can check your, your package and, and your, your, you can check your package using the R command check to make sure it's falling in line with the test for CRAN. If you run the R command check, it's also going to run your test as well. But if you don't, if you don't meet the expectations of the R command ch check, it's not going to run your tests. And so there's opportunities to just, or there's tools to just run your test file. And in my case, I can't run the R command check because I haven't developed a package to meet all those expectations. So you can just run your specific test file. I've been having a lot of trouble with the test coverage. And so we really haven't talked about coverage too much. But basically what you can do is you can run, uh, it's kind of, it's basically like a test to see how much of your code in your application is covered by your testing framework. And so what you can get is you can get an output of what code is actually touched by a test. Now there's some conversation that I came across that coverage isn't always the best metric because you can still have bugs regardless of how much coverage you have. And there's some, there's some perspective out there, people saying that don't fall into the trap of saying that, oh, I have 99% coverage. There's nothing wrong with my application because you can have all that coverage and still have bugs within your code. But, oh, go ahead, Kevin. I was going to quickly say, yeah, I about fell into that trap, but I stopped myself. I was like, it's like, because I did a, test from point blank and it didn't match up with the function i'm like oh but it doesn't cover my test coverage <laughs> so i'm like eh, it doesn't matter as long as it pass <laughs> so i've and then the other thing it goes back to quality is subjective you know a, a metric for your application might not be code coverage it might be covering the most critical pieces and so you don't and i shouldn't say this again week of experience you know you might not be striving for 99 code coverage but I think the thing about it, going back to what the book was talking about, is, is that you have tools to get that metric for you. And so if that's something that you base your view of quality, run that test, see what's being covered. And I also think the book talked about the idea of like, if you see something that's not covered and it's critical that you should write a test for, that's a good way to kind of think about, oh, should I be writing a test to make sure I do cover this critical piece of my code? So just real quick i put a link to um uh, it works hand in hand with um the test coverage it's a cover page and i really love the output of that package it runs does similar to um the coverage but it'll give you a summary of what ran so you could provide that to a someone to list all the tests whether it passed whether you have a warning 
um, in a nice uh, markdown file. Yeah, I've seen I've seen people talk about that that package, and I was thinking about going to it because I keep this is the error that I keep getting. Like every time that I run this test coverage, and if anybody has any insight on this, like, and actually, you know what, Kevin, this might be that I'm not putting my library in it. That could be something that's not making this work. But this is the failure that I keep coming across, and I can't, I I can't get it to work. So, but um, if anybody wants to help me figure that out later or dig into that, please let me know. But you can get an assessment of like how much of, of what code your, your tests are covering. So we talked about non-reactive functions. So I don't think we need to, oh, um, the next one was talking about snapshots. So if you have like a UI function, you can do what are called snapshots uh, or tests that use a snapshot. So in my case here, what I have is um, I have a function called range month floor. Um, so what I did is I created a function that would be in an in input within the UI. And um, I haven't implemented it within the application, but I wrote a test for it. Basically what it does is it just, it constrains the, um, the date to like the beginning of the month or the first of the month. And so that's what that input does. But as we've talked about in the past, what happens is with these input functions, all those input functions do is just generate HTML. That's all they do. And so what you can do is you can use that outputted HTML in your tests. And so what it does is it, the first time that you run and let me pull up the test so you can see it again, if I'm losing anybody, you know, please let me know. Um, so range month floor. So I have this test that uses a snapshot. And basically what it does is, is I provide the start date for that specific function. So this is the test date data that I want to use. And so this gets passed into my um, date range input. And I think I see what I did wrong here. Um, and what it does is, is that on the first run that it does of this expect snapshot, what it does is it creates this folder in your test that folder that contains this HTML output. And so what your test actually does the next time that you run that test is it takes this snap and compares it to what your function outputted. And so if those things do not match up, then the test fails. <clears throat> the book talks about, <coughs> excuse me, the book talks about that this is a very fragile type of test because if you think about how HTML might change on the page, one minor change is going to fail your test. So if a div tag changes and ID changes for some reason, even if it's a space, something minor, it's going to fail it. Going back to that, like get merge conflict. Like if you have one small thing that's different, it's going to catch it and it's going to fail that test. Um, what is nice about this though, with the expect snapshot is, is that if something does change, um, it's going to ask if this change is what was expected. And if you say yes to that expectation, then it's going to, then it's going to reset your snap file to that new expectation. So Ryan, were you going to say something? Yeah, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. Um, so CRC, MD5 checksums, uh, Hemingway app, and, and, and being able to author uh, I don't know, eloquent English forms of making sure that you're hitting the grade level of, of what your audience is receiving, et cetera. I'm going with you, Colin, on the journalism thing. When there's a, there's a funk, or it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concept, it's a paradigm that given a operating systems language, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, R Studio, uh, or just R, um, given the function itself, here's my data input, I should expect the same output regardless. Going with this concept of snapshot, I have reason to believe that it's just doing either a MD5 or CRC concept, mathematical uh, concept of the data that it's expecting to see from a textual standpoint, like adding up all your, your uh, characters and if the number matches, you know, all the spaces and tabs and characters, et cetera, if it matches good test passed, 
or it's doing a diff, diff doc concept. If any character doesn't match, then it's going to error out the, uh, the, the uh, fail the test because the, the two snapshots don't match. There's a lot about this testing function that I'm kind of thinking about. And it's, it's really, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm not struggling. I'm trying to wrap my brain around how to visualize what a testing service is doing. So if you've ever done any GCC compilers or even built your own compiler, you enter data and then what you get out should match regardless of the language that you're writing it in. So if you're using a, a you know, a C++ compiler or a C compiler or whatever language you're writing in, if you follow the same concepts, the output should be the same regardless. And if it doesn't, then the test fails. HTML, JavaScript is a is a component of the H, uh, of the web language. Um, it's a very verbose concept. It has to work, and if it doesn't, it's going to fail or it's going to error out. When we cross into different browsers, when we cross into different operating systems, the management of those variables, the management of that content, should be agnostic to the uh, calculation of what it's it's producing. So the the building of these test functions have to be matching with all of these different environmental conditions, regardless of, of us as a developer. We could be interpreting this in Internet Explorer. We could be interpreting it in Chrome, Firefox, you know, Edge. All of them must match. And if it doesn't, then you're going you're gonna to err out on the code. And the same can be said with an operating system as well. If it's Linux, Mac, you know, uh, uh, any derivative type operating system, Microsoft, um, I'm probably going off on a tangent. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking the conversation in a different direction, but the whole concept of testing is to ensure what we're writing matches the expectation of output and being agnostic to the, to the variables, the environmental variables of expectation. Does that help at all? I'm probably being a little bit too cavalier in my comments, but testing in general is, is a very key point and I can take this outside of, of just a computer science or a networking type logic. Even if you were building a engineering, right? Uh, you're building a bridge, you're building a building, whatever the case is. I've got a load tolerance I have to expect. And if, if the materials that I'm applying for this don't match, then I'm going to have a collapse or I'm overbuilding it. I'm over budgeting for the, the building itself, right? Um, I'm not meeting my price point that I'm giving the customer. Again, I'm sorry I'm, I'm going off the deep end, but it all kind of, it means all the same thing. Does that help? I'm no, I, I, no, no, I, I think, no, I, I think, I think there, there's a, there's, there's a few points in there that, you know, um, that I kind of came across when I was studying this too, was, you know, when you're mentioning environment, you know, the environment too, like it should be separate from the environment and, you know, well, big picture, I think like fr fragility, why, you know, fragility, right? Like this snapshot test is very fragile because it has many different components to which can change that snapshot dependent on which environment you are running the test or your application is running. And so, you know, I, I might, I might've got a little too overconfident when I was learning this because I was like, oh, now I can, now I can see about learning continuous integration and just run my tests automatically in the cloud. Um, obviously I got smacked down pretty quick when I was looking into that, because when you dig into that stuff and, and Jim Hester, um, somebody who's also really active in the R community um, and has developed a lot of R packages, he talks about that environmental constraints too, or running tests in the different environments. And a lot of the tidyverse code, what they do is they run their testing framework, you know, in the cloud, but they also test it for different operating system versions. And so what they'll do is, is, is that they'll not only, you know, once they push their code into version control, it's not only running their tests for your computer locally, but it's also running your tests for different, you know, for different versions of operating system, whether that be Windows, Mac, Linux, so on and so forth. Am I kind of, am I on the same wavelength as you, Ryan? I mean, hundred percent. Yeah. I, well, even when you said that, I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like, okay, so Microsoft, we've got XP, Windows 7, you know, Vista, Windows 8, Windows 10. If we go to Linux and we've got Debian versus RPM based packaging, if we're going into Mac, you know, the various different operating systems within Mac, like 
it, it aggregates down to the lowest level and it, it, it's very specific. Everything about computing is extremely explicit. And the, I guess that's the concept you want to remember is that computers are really dumb. They only tell, they only do what you're giving them. They're only, they're only calculating what you're giving them. Um, and so you're testing to ensure the compliance or the configuration of that environment. I'm giving you these variables. Here's the parameters I'm, I'm expecting you to, to operate with. And here's the output that I'm, I'm wanting you to calculate with. And if it doesn't match, test fail. We got to go back to the drawing board and figure out what are we missing? What, what piece did we, we fail to, to convert? So. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, the, like just this whole chapter kind of, it was kind of like a, a paradigm shift for me, you know, kind of, it kind of opened my mind a little bit more of like the complexity of all of this. And it's like, you know, it's not as simple as like, you know, just putting inputs here and there and it looks good and it runs on my computer, you know, now you have to, and I guess that's kind of why testing is important. Kind of big picture again, is it's like, this isn't just going to run on your computer anymore it's going to be interfacing in many different environments. And so if you're, you know, it's great to create your own custom apps for yourself, but if you're going to create this in a production environment, you have to have a testing framework so that you have a quality product that's getting rolled out, um, you know, for your users to use. And so, um, yeah, I, I'm talking like a software engineer, but I am far from it. So, <laughs> Um, so, and if there's anybody out there, please tweet at me and be like, you know, Colin, you're completely wrong about your philosophy. I will be more than happy to do that. But yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I think you're saying all the things that I've come across so far, Ryan. So, um, I wish I could provide more depth to the conversation, but, uh, this is a week's worth of study. <laughs> um, okay. So we're, we're about, uh, we're about six we're at, well, we're at right at seven o'clock and I don't want to go past our hour because I, I know um, just in case people have some somewhere else to be. Uh, we still have about maybe half the chapter left to go. Um, so I think maybe just next week we can kind of finish up this chapter and then maybe talk about security because security is a pretty short chapter. So I don't know what the group thinks or any input on that. I was going to add a comment to security if it's okay. Um, I was able to get my Docker registry to operate uh, by turning off security. So I want to approach the subject in the context that get something that works first and then start building the firewalls and the, and the uh, um, I don't know, a bit bad, bad. Um, I got some bad analogies for security, but the, I got the registry to work. I was able to get everything to operate. Now I need to figure out how to put the security barriers back into place. And the relation to our shiny app and web development is going to be the, the middleman, uh, uh, man in the middle uh, vulnerabilities. So if you're going to, you know, spoof uh, proxies, spoof IP addresses, be able to, you know, hack a particular packet and then ingest some malware into your exchange. Um, security is critical in the calculation of your, of your certificate or your handshake between server and client. I'd be more than happy to take on the chapter of security if anybody else wants to do that. Um, I know I'm still going for the performance uh, chapter. That's really what I'm driving at. Um, next week, I'm scheduled to do the JavaScript with the engineering uh, grade shiny apps. Um, performance is hand in hand with that. But uh, does anybody have any comments on security? Sorry, Colin. No, if you want to take security, go for it. Yeah. I mean, I think honestly, because we only have like two really two other concepts that I want to cover. Okay. And that has to do with like the the use of this in, in a reactive context. And because um, honestly, I don't think I'll be able to I'll discuss JavaScript and then some other some other concepts, but honestly, I probably can get this done in about share the rest of the examples, get it done halfway through, and then the rest could probably be spent on security. So, um, Connor, I know I think in last week you had mentioned a comment about security. If I'm mistaken with that statement, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I could probably put something together, but if, if you if you have an interest in it, then maybe I could uh, 
It looks like it looks like an interesting chapter, but I could probably add some context. Um, I was just going to say that. On top of your presentation. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if I'm presenting, if you want to jump in and, and throw your two cents in as we go through the, the, the material, really the biggest thing about security that I'm, I'm going to preface before we actually get into the section is it's a really big topic and it's, it's all like, I don't know, banking, checking accounts, credit cards, <laughs> debit cards, right? It's like, it's such mundane boring material, but it's extremely important in the, in the development of web-based um, media that you're going to be presenting to the world. Um, there's always hackers out there. And so, yeah, it's the, it's the paradigm of uh, trying to stay ahead of the hackers. And it's a very, very difficult subject. Yeah, I would be appreciative if you, if you take that. And like I said, I, I think we can get, I think I get this done and then we talk okay. about security next week and then whatever bleeds over right. into that next after that week, I think would be good. Okay. So um, does anybody have any other questions or comments? Like I said, I don't want to hold, I can hang out for a little bit longer um, and kind of cover uh, the examples that I covered tonight, but you know, I don't want to hold anybody back if anybody has to go. So I think, I think, I think the, the yeah, best way for me to learn this is to apply this to some of the existing shiny apps I run. So that'll just take a lot of, a lot of experimentation. Yeah. I mean, honestly, the big thing about it was like, just creating the application and creating a testing framework. That's where I learned a lot of it. Like I read the chapter first and I was like, I gotta just, I gotta just sit down and create some tests. And that's where I really learned it. Um, and you know, I think that's, it's just one of, it's one of those things you got to practice it to know it, but that's my viewpoint. So. Cool. Well, like I said, I don't want to hold anybody. So if anybody's got to jump right. off or if anybody's got any questions, you know, shoot All them right. out. See you guys next week.